the serologic surveillance of healthcare workers for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, why is this important? You know, a lot of people have been doing various serological surveys of various populations around the country over the past few weeks. And, you know, we found numbers anywhere from, you know, around 3% in, in some places, like Santa Clara County a few weeks ago. Um, you know, um, in, in LA, they found 4 to 5%. New York, they found 13%. Um, and New York City was more like 20, 20 to 25%. And you know these are rates of antibodies that you're detecting to SARS-CoV-2, and it's important because in a population, while while we we probably aren't at the point where we can tell an individual person, hey, you have immunity because you have this antibody, we do think that for a population, there is you know some level of um, herd immunity that that comes with having more of the population in, infected with SARS-CoV-2. So it's, it, you know, for our healthcare workers, we want to see where we are both to assess, um, are we doing a good job with infection control practices? Is there a particular place in the hospital that is, you know, more at risk that we need to concentrate a little bit more to try to prevent the spread of COVID-19? Or, you know, do, do we actually have a much higher rate of seropositivity in our healthcare workers than we thought based on our screening and, and how many workers we, we found? So. You know, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our methodology. And so you may have been familiar from this from when I presented um, a couple of weeks ago, but the coronavirus antigen microarray, um, this is essentially ELISA, but done against 67 different antigens with four replicates per antigen um, and simultaneously to IgG and IgA and IgM. And, you know, we have antigens from SARS CoV 2, of course. Uh, multiple antigens, we have seven right, right now, and we're expanding that in, in a future version of the array. Um, we also have other epidemic coronaviruses, SARS-1 and MERS, uh, and seasonal coronaviruses. Uh, those are the four strains that cause the common cold, as well as other respiratory viruses, things like flu, RSV, um, parainfluenza, to, to look at how are some of these other respiratory viruses also going through the population? Because, you know, many people who have symptoms, test negative for COVID, you know, they may have something else. So this is our, our workflow. You know, these uh, microarrays are printed and, and up to 5,000, uh, and when I say microarray, that's essentially enough to test one sample. Uh, uh, approximately 5,000 of those can be, present, uh, can be printed within one printing run. And, you know, probing, we have a high throughput uh, method, you know, using multi-pipetters to, to probe up to essentially a thousand samples at a time. And then, you know, the probing essentially, um, the patient's serum sample is put onto this slide and the antibodies from the patient's blood bind to the antigens on the slide. And then, um, you know, secondary antibodies are fluorescently labeled and bind to the patient's antibodies and then we image that, um, you know, right now we use a desktop instrument, but we're actually working on making it more portable using a portable digital microscope. And then uh, the analysis is actually, you know, I show a laptop here, but now we're actually moving that all to the cloud and having sort of a automated platform. And so, you know, we recently um, published a study in a bio archive and we submitted it to Nature Communications. Uh, so we looked at, we validated this array using 23 positive specimens from PCR confirmed COVID-19 cases that were all collected at least seven days after symptom onset, because, you know, that, that's sort of the minimum amount of time you need to detect serology. And 144 negative specimens that were collected prior to the pandemic. And so we looked at antibody levels in these positive and negative um, serum or plasma specimens. And you know, we see a very clear cut difference between the positive specimens, which have high uh, antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 and the negative specimens, which have you know, low antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Um, for other respiratory viruses, uh, these two um, sample sets are fairly similar. So you know, that shows us that we're really seeing a specific difference with SARS-CoV-2 and you know, um, th there's different antigens on the surface of the virus 
you know, there's um, the spike protein is the major immunodominant antigen. That's what actually binds to the lung epithelial cells. And so, you know, we have multiple forms of, of that antigen. We have um, the different domains, S1 and S2, separated out. We also have the nucleoprotein antigen. And in, in our work, we find that that antigen is actually discriminates a little bit better than the spike protein because, you know, part of, of the spike protein, the S2, is shared amongst uh, different coronaviruses. So we see some low-level cross-reactivity um, to, to that segment. So, you know, different serology tests that are out there on the market, some use nucleoprotein, some use spike, but, you know, we have all of these, these antigens, you know, so, some use just the um, receptor binding domain, but we can actually compare all of them together. And actually, um, you know, when we look at the performance, uh, we can take single antigens and look at the performance and specificity sensitivity for here detecting IgG on the left, IgA on the right. Um, and, you know, we actually find that multiple antigens together gives you a better sensitivity and specificity, um, not um, really surprising. But the interesting thing is, you know, two or three antigens is sort of optimal um, in terms of, of predictability. Now, you know, we, we need to increase this to a larger, um, you know, number of, of samples to sort of, you know, we've done the, about a little over 150 right now. But you know, even with with those samples, you know, with with for example, these three antigens here, you essentially get 100% uh, specificity and 94% sensitivity for IgG, and that's a lot better than what we've seen with some of the other tests that are on the market. You know, some of them claim that level of of uh, discrimination, but when they're independently validated, uh, you know, that you don't always get get that level of performance. So. You know, that's one important thing here to really get a good test. You really want to have multiple antigens together. So, you know, let me get a little bit into the study. And by the way, we'll have plenty of time for questions. And I know Sebastian Schubel and uh, Phil Felgner are both here on the call too. So, you know, they can answer your questions as well. So Sebastian really took the lead on, on this um, serologic survey um, study in terms of, you know, the IRB and, and kind of de designing the study and everything. And we've actually gotten a lot of input from uh, Susan Huang in epidemiology infection prevention as well, uh, to sort of, uh, you know, because the hospital is interested in tracking, you know, seropositivity amongst its staff for operational purposes. And so we've been working very closely with them to sort of meet their goals and meet our goals as well. And so, you know, we, we wanted to estimate the seroprevalence of COVID-19 among our staff and correlate it with both epidemiologic and occupational risk. And so our core study involves about approximately 1,100 healthcare workers that were pr either previously tested for COVID or have been working on dedicated COVID units or on what we call control units. These are essentially similar parts of the hospital, except they're not seeing COVID patients. Uh, and we're going to test these both using our microarray as well as a commercially available diazyme assay that's used in, in the clinical lab. So I've been working closely with Rob Edwards to sort of set that up and, you know, get part of the sample over to our lab and, and uh, cross-validate it with, with their assay. So, you know, some of the, the positive, the um, t tested healthcare workers are either PCR positive or PCR negative. And, you know, there's approximately 300 of, of those healthcare workers. And then, you know, high risk and low risk workers, high risk workers, we say are on the COVID units and there's an emergency department unit, uh, a telemetry floor and an ICU. And low risk, similarly, there's a telem two telemetry floor units and an ICU unit. And there's about you know, 400 patients total in each of those high risk and low risk cohorts. So you know, when we do the analysis, we're gonna compare those different cohorts and see, okay, you know, do we see a zero positivity difference? But we're gonna go a little bit further than that. So we have a red cap survey that I think uh, Cesar Figueroa, Carlos Chavez have been working very closely with us to design. And so, you know, the red cap survey looks at clinical risk factors, age, BMI, comorbidities, smoking, um, as well as some, um, sorry, uh, let me just get back into this, as well as some occupational risk factors in terms of, you know, where does the person work? Um, you know, what is their level of contact with COVID patients? Have they done procedures, high risk procedures on COVID patients like intubation? And then, you know, we asked them about, have you had COVID symptoms in the, in the past? Have you been tested for them? And have you been treated? And then we look at, 
you know, um, the people who have tested positive, obviously we, we expect to see zero positivity as we did in our validation study. So study participants who test negative will actually allow them to retest after a minimum of two weeks to sort of track changes over time. Um, the study participants who test positive, we will also try to follow them longitudinally and retest them periodically to assess their changes in antibody levels over time and correlate with the risk of reinfection. So, you know, by really studying these seropositive individuals over time, we can see, are any of them getting reinfected? And if so, you know, does that correlate with lower antibody levels as, as we have seen with some other um, coronaviruses? And then leftover specimens, you know, cause we want this, if we're gonna go through the work of collecting these specimens, we want this to really help the research community here at UCI. So, you know, we've worked with Rob Edwards to make sure that these left leftover specimens are available to other researchers via the UCI COVID biorepository. And, you know, we're going to also try to uh, use part of them for further validation testing, such as a virus neutralization assay on a portion of, of the positives. And then, you know, we're uh, pursuing multiple sources of funding for this study. So, you know, I, I know we recently got, uh, in addition to this COVID, Kraft COVID grant, we have a, a, a University of California Office of the President pilot grant that, that we received. And, you know, we've applied for other sources of funding. Uh, you know, the hospital uh, may chip in some, some money into this because they're interested from an operational perspective. We have private donors that have been very interested in this. Uh, you know, we've been in discussions with BARDA and, and about NIH grants. So there's really a lot of interest in this area and you know the more partners we can get to help support this we can extend the study so we can enroll more healthcare workers we can collect longitudinal specimens over a longer time frame and we can expand the testing to the public eventually so this you know this is a study that's really designed that as we get more resources we expect to be able to expand it so okay. that's uh, really all that i had so if anyone has any questions yeah, so we have a few minutes for questions in our new <laughs> relaxed mode. We still managed to go over the actual exact time. So um, please do ask questions. This is a super interesting topic. So will you be able, I'll start off while people are, are thinking uh, more. Will you be able to comment on what might be prospects for neutralizing antibodies from any of your studies? Well, so, so that, that's why we want to take a portion of the positives and do a neutralization assay for correlation. And, you know, we, we, because we, we want to see that correlation and, and see. Um, so would that you know, one be, of the, would be an in vitro cell culture inhibition assay? Yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that would be an in vitro, um, yeah. Is that a like fusion live virus. assay or is that a infection assay? No, well, it, it would write, we're actually working on ways to, to try to develop a version of the assay that can be done higher throughput. But uh, right now it would probably be an in vitro, like live virus. Uh, you know, we're working on all the BSL-3 approvals and everything, but um, it would be a live virus, um, you know, probably into a cell line like Vero cells or, you know, a, a cell line like that. And, um, essentially checking the serum to see if it can neutralize from de developing a cytopathic effect. Um, that, that would be what it would be initially. And, and uh, we hope to eventually get a higher throughput one that has a more of a reporter um, assay associated with it. Uh, it's Mike Bookmeyer. Um, yeah. You know, there've been a lot of ideas about cross reactivity between uh, the common cold and other upper respiratory coronaviruses. and and uh, both SARS-1 and SARS-2. And have you thought about doing any kind of ratio analysis or any looking for s stimulation of, uh, of responses based on one infection or the other? You know, on some of these people that you may encounter, you may encounter common colds and not SARS. Uh, and if you can show that, that that will boost a response, which also reacts with SARS, that, that would be decent evidence, you know, for a cross reactivity between the two. And Ray Welsh has proposed that, that it may be this cross-reactivity that makes this disease so serious in the elderly because they've had more experience in the past with upper respiratory coronaviruses. Yeah, so, so you know, we're not going to directly get that information in this study, but, but one way we can indirectly look at that is, you know, we think that a lot of that cross-reactivity is with this S2 um, 
part of the spike protein. Um, because it, at least in, in our studies, that's where, where we see some cross reactivity with the general population. And so, you know, we can look at the levels of antibodies to that domain versus others. And if we find that, let's say, the severe, you know, the healthcare workers, because we have healthcare workers who've been hospitalized, who've been in the ICU, you know, if we find that some, some of the people who had more severe disease tend to have higher responses towards um, that antigen versus, um, you know, nuclear protein or some other antigen, uh, we can start to look at different profiles and see are some of them associated with worse disease and are those profiles also more reactive against, against the antigens we see some cross reactivity too. So I think we can indirectly get some evidence for that um, hypothesis. I, I, you know, I, I think that's a good hypothesis and I think it's definitely something that deserves to be studied. It's Bernadette. Um, uh, I'm interested in the sort of the epi uh, component of this. Is there any um, sense of whether you are going to ask about families, living conditions, think about sampling, families at all? Because it's something that I think would be really interesting, right? There's a lot of talk about where people are getting, uh, are, are being positive. Is it in the work situation or is it somehow related to who they're living with, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. so we, we do ask about, do you have a COVID-19 contact, you know, in your household or, or that you've interacted with? And then what's, you know, what's your sort of level of interaction with that uh, person if, if you do have have someone, um, you know, we, we haven't gone like further and asked about like, you know, socioeconomic factors or, or, or other things. I mean, our healthcare worker cohort, is, it's sort of a very um, specific uh, cohort, you know, in terms of, of those factors. But, but yes, we, we definitely do ask about, about the uh, COVID contacts at home and, and level of, you know, contact. Yeah, if I can add to that, we're, um, we're probably going to amend our application to the IRB relatively quickly to try to bring in the opportunity to test community volunteers. And in particular, we're going to be interested in testing uh, people who live with healthcare workers that we end up finding to be positive. Uh, in, in addition to other people who may just be interested, I know Dr. Felgner probably gets about 10 emails a day from people who are desperate to have their blood tested on his platform because it is so much more robust than what's commercially available right now. Just to remind or not to just to add to sort of like the duality of our study really is that there's there's a population we're testing, which you can see on the screen right now, which is really being sourced through the effort that EIP is doing. But that the, the theory behind that is that the the healthcare worker at greatest risk is the healthcare worker working with COVID patients, which could potentially be a false uh, premise. Um, one of the things I learned when I was in New York is, is that the healthcare workers that got sick at the hospital I was in almost exclusively got sick in the community. And they know that because the two weeks before I got there, they didn't have any healthcare workers get sick despite the hospital being full of COVID patients. The healthcare workers that did fall ill to this illness by and large, were falling sick when the community social distancing New York stuff was not in place. And just basic masking and hand washing techniques were more than adequate, really, to protect the healthcare workers that were managing COVID patients on a daily basis. I think that probably will be true here as well. So I'm really interested not just to test the COVID units. I really want to test the entire hospital. And I think that the platform that we have because it can do so many tests per week and it's so easy to get a sample with just a finger prick and a capillary tube. And we can, you know, at, at a thousand tests per week, we can really test a lot of people in the hospital from all sorts of areas. And maybe we can identify epidemiologically different risk groups uh, like you're suggesting that have nothing to do with contact with COVID patients. Right, and I was gonna say, I would be really happy to, I, I, a lot of my work is in sort of networks and thinking about if we could sort of plot out networks, it's a little like contact tracing, but a, a little bit different. If we could plot out networks and then look at, um, at some of this testing, it would be really fascinating. Yeah, I would yeah, just no. add, add to that that Leslie Thompson is getting involved in also sequence, doing whole genome sequencing of of uh, COVID patients. So that may also add some useful information. 